Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this conference and uh, uh, letting me have uh, uh, my presentation. And uh, secondly, I want to thank all of you who, who stayed uh, for this last presentation, which happened to be uh, mine and which uh, will actually be just a talk. I don't have a presentation, so excuse me for that. I, I hope you will be able to uh, follow. Um, so my talk is uh, connected definitely with the previous one, uh, insofar as it also concerns uh, contemporary conditions such as Anthropocene and climate change, but it's a, it is a little bit less uh, practical or concerned with, uh, with activism, that basically or also individually can affect some things, and it is much more uh, theoretical. But still, uh, it is uh, connected, uh, it or it bears connection with uh, the practice, insofar as the way we think about things, and this is something I will try to show, uh, influences the way we act, and even more so insofar as the way we think about things conditions the way uh, we can act. Now, particularly, my topic is the problem of human uh, versus non-human distinction in contemporary feminism, as you have already heard. And um, so uh, let me start by kind of a little bit simplified introduction by saying that traditionally, uh, feminism has uh, been concerned uh, with interhuman relations, uh, especially gender relations and the power relations with which uh, these are uh, permeated. Uh, but uh, the shift started to occur uh, somewhere in the uh, 80s, uh, although, again, with, uh, with having in, bearing in mind the previous presentation, we could say that uh, the shift already occurred in the 70s with, with the emergence of ecofeminism, but I'm uh, following here a little bit different lineage of uh, thought. So, uh, and I'm focusing on the work of Donna Haraway, and especially her Cyborg Manifesto published in 18, uh, 1985, which had uh, such an immense influence on um, uh, feminist theory and various feminist theories, actually, that uh, followed in uh, uh, subsequent uh, years and decades. Uh, so again, maybe uh, simplifying a little bit, we could say that what uh, uh, the Donna Haraway aimed to show in that text how uh, the boundaries between human and non-human, with non-human uh, include meaning here uh, both animals, plants, and machines, have become increasingly porous due to uh, development of science and technology. And I think the great contemporary example uh, for that is actually uh, uh, the uh, pandemic of uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, which showed uh, how the virus, which was previously uh, so distant uh, and uh, unrelated to human species, uh, to the extent that we didn't know about its existence, suddenly uh, uh, became connected with us and caused such major changes in our uh, lives. Uh, the second thing which, which was important for Haraway uh, was, uh, that's something I already mentioned with the development of science, how, uh, for example, the emergence of uh, information science, uh, which enabled uh, us to look at uh, all uh, living uh, beings as a uh, uh, system, for, system for, for processing information. And from that, uh, from that perspective, really, there's, there's not, not much difference between whether we talk about animals, plants, or uh, humans. Uh, and uh, the influence of uh, Donna Haraway's work, together with the influence of some other theorists and philosophers, for example, uh, for example Bruno Latour, uh, has eventually um, uh, led to uh, what we could now uh, call a post-human or non-human turn in feminism, which occurred um, somewhere in the 90s, and uh, for, for the, with the publication of two books uh, that were concerned with post-human, uh, by, one by Catherine Hales, and uh, the other one by Rosie Bradotti, which soon uh, uh, formed, actually, or established, uh, really, uh, post-human feminism. Uh, 
So I will now uh, return uh, to post-human feminism as it is uh, conceived by uh, Rosi Radori. So uh, Radori writes in some of her crucial texts uh, on post-human feminism that, quote, the post-human turn is triggered by the convergence of feminist anti-humanism on the one hand and anti-anthropocentrism on the other. Uh, now, um, uh, the, the, the second uh, uh, tendency, anti-anthropocentrism, is much more important, obviously, for my talk today. Uh, but I will have to say something about anti-humanism because it has been it has it has been so prevalent, actually, in uh, not just in feminist theory but also other uh, critical theories, and it also um, you know uh, makes for the distinction uh, between uh, xenofeminism and I will talk later and uh, posthuman feminism. Mm -hmm. So uh, anti-humanism had various really formulations in the uh, in the second half of the 20th century, both in philosophy, for example, in the works of Matthew Heidegger, Michel Foucault, Louis Althusser, but also in critical theory, in feminist theory and uh, post-colonial theory, for example, just to name the two. Uh, what, it can, uh, what is central for its emergence of, for, for this critique of classical humanism is the recognition of historical limitations of the emancipatory programs based on humanist principles. And these humanist principles, which have been criticized, are universalism, uh, the binary structure of thought, and the theological vision of progress based on uh, reason. Now, uh, the, the universality really here concerns especially uh, the critique of man as the universal subject of history and measure of all things. Um, and uh, what what uh, these feminists uh, uh, aim to show is how this allegedly universal notion is actually tainted by various particularities, such as, for example, uh, white, male, heterosexual, uh, middle class, European, etc. And again, to put uh, Rosa Gredori, uh, in other words, the known and subject is implicitly assumed to be masculine, white, urbanized, speaking a standard language, heterosexually inscribed in a reproductive unit and a full citizen of, of a recognized polity, end of quote. So uh, what this, uh, uh, in other words, this means that uh, some particular groups obviously have privileged uh, uh, access to this, you know, privileged access to this universality, while at the same time other groups are excluded uh, from it. Uh, and um, these forms actually, uh, what then you have is obviously binary opposition between human, this supposed uh, universality, and its actual others which can be, you know, depending on the, some particularity which you, which you, uh, uh, which you uh, put in focus, uh, those uh, others can be both uh, women, blacks, homosexuals, and eventually uh, animals or non-humans. But what is problematic here, I uh, think, and I want to highlight is, for example, how Rosie Redotti writes about, you know, kind of, no pr problem about masculinist, masculinist universalism and supposedly uh, feminist pluralism. So uh, I have this problem really with gendering uh, these uh, notions like universality and reason. So uh, instead, uh, instead of criticizing this historical uh, uh, misinterpretations of those uh, concepts, what you do actually is you accept that, say it's fine, and uh, and you obviously try to focus on you know difference, for example, which then became which then became a central concept for various uh, feminist uh, theories. But um, what I think is much more productive, what should be done, is uh, reclaiming the universality and reclaiming the reason from post uh, from feminism, but also from post-colonial theory, rather than denouncing it. Uh, okay, I think uh, now I said enough about this anti-humanist uh, aspect of post-human uh, post feminism, and I have to switch really to uh, anti-anthropocentrism, which is this other uh, tendency. Uh, 
it is concerned with the critique of human exceptionalism or species supremacy, and it is that is something you already heard in the previous uh, uh, talk. Uh, and uh, the important thing here about this understanding of uh, human non-human distinction uh, here is that it is understood uh, as an ontological distinction. And for example, uh, uh, Rosie Bradori talks about the separation between bios, which is exclusively human life, from zo, which is yeah, the life of animals and non-human entities. So what, what I want you to focus and notice here that um, this, uh, this is an ontological distinction between human and non-human as two different types of being or two different uh, types of uh, life. And um, uh, so what is done then uh, with the crit critique of, uh, with the critique on anthropocentrism is uh, uh, trying to, you try to replace that radical separation between human and non-human with, with the set of relational links uh, between, between them. And um, this is in post-human feminism really uh, uh, an ontological maneuver, I, I have to say. And uh, it's, as such, it has to be differentiated from uh, strictly, discursive, strictly speaking discursive uh, maneuver or, uh, for example, a deconstructive maneuver. Why, why say it is ontological? It is because it is grounded in certain type of ontology in flat and monist ontology of imminence or difference, which says that everything exists in the same way, in other words, the being is said in one and the same way for everything that is, so this means that it is flat. And the other is uh, that everything is an expression of one and the same substance, uh, uh, which, for example, uh, Jane uh, Bennett calls vibrant matter, and this is why it is monist ontology. So, as philosopher Ansel Parson uh, says, uh, methodologic quote, methodologically, post-human feminist theory abandons the social constructivist approach and deconstructive political strategies of post-structuralism and embraces monism and vitalist ontologies. So, uh, this is also the point where I have to kind of uh, a little bit distance myself from the kind of the term uh, deconstruction of the binary which I used in relation to post-human feminism in the abstract of this talk. And uh, but it's so important to note that actually this is another point where I have to correct myself that I somewhat simplifying they said that you know the boundary, the, the, sorry, distinction is abolished in post-human feminism or new materials feminism, which here at least amounts to, to the same thing. It is actually not. And that is something that Rosie Bredori highlights in, in her text, uh, that uh, although the post-human feminism is uh, that, um, sorry, that uh, post-human feminism uh, preserves what she calls um, anthropologically bound structure of the human. And uh, this is what uh, also she calls anthropomorphism. And now anthropomorphism is not here uh, understood as um, ascribing human qualities to non-human entities, but as sp uh, specific uh, uh, embodiment and embeddedness uh, that characterizes uh, human species and the differenti differentiated from others. In other words, generally speaking, uh, in, from the perspective of post-human feminism, you can say that beings differ insofar as they are differently embodied and embedded. Okay, now I turn to uh, uh, the second uh, theoretical formation, and that is xenofeminism. It's a, it is an even newer one, and it uh, uh, emerged uh, in, uh, if I'm correct, in 2015 with the publication of Xenofeminist Manifesto, which was uh, written by uh, the collective Laboria Cubanix, uh, whose members are, for example, Helen Hester, Patricia Reed, Amy Arland, and others. Uh, it shares some traits with the post-human uh, feminism, but also with uh, cyber feminism and cyber feminism, but it, it is also distinctive from them insofar as it aims to reintroduce humanism and rationalism into feminist theory and practice. And this is explicitly said in the manifest 
where it is written, uh, quote, Sino feminism is a ration. Uh, but uh, it should be said that the xenofeminism doesn't just critically appropriate classical humanism and rationalism, but actually uh, revises the, the content of these concepts, and in that it relies very much on uh, contemporary philosophy uh, and you know, contemporary uh, revisions uh, of these concepts in philosophy. And this is a topic uh, too, uh, too complex for the, to be included in this uh, as a part of this talk. But what I could uh, say at least is that uh, that uh, humanism really uh, in contemporary formulations actually becomes inhumanism insofar as it is uh, it extends beyond uh, any historical understanding of the human. Um, and also, uh, rationalism uh, 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 is uh, uh, untied uh, from the human, so it don't. It is not understood as uh, exclusively a human uh, feature. Uh, now, I, I want to talk about the problem, uh, the way the xenofeminist uh, xenofeminism understands this distinction between human and non-human. And uh, it, it is understood here uh, mainly as a distinction between sapiens versus sentience. And uh, this is something that is actually uh, taken uh, from uh, a philosophy of mind, uh, where you, obviously you have or, or sapiens are simply speaking, you know, creatures that think, and sentience are creatures that feel. And this is somewhat. Uh, uh, pro problematic or simplified insofar as we know today from the researchers in uh, biology that uh, animals uh, and plants can also think, at least to the some extent. And uh, so, you know, you cannot just say that they only uh, feel. But still, you know, uh, there is a kind of quite uh, important distinction in the uh, cognitive abilities between uh, humans and other uh, species. So uh, basically, what is uh, uh, is uh, what what is the implication of it is that once uh, your greater cognitive abilities, also uh, 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 the humans, because of their greater cognitive abilities, also bear greater response ability. Uh, uh, understood here really etymologically as ability to respond. And with that in mind, I'm, I now turn. Uh, to political implications of these understandings. Uh, now, I will first talk about a little bit about post-human uh, politics of post-human uh, feminism, uh, which uh, really much uh, kind of focuses, uh, for example, on exploding relationality on all levels in a, and in all directions, or to quote Rosie Perdotti, becoming relational in a complex and multi-directional manner. Uh, it also uh, foregrounds the politics of the non-human agents. And this is something, again, we heard uh, in the talk about uh, ecofeminism. Uh, then there are concepts like becoming Earth or geocentered, becoming perceptible, zoocentered, uh, and creating cross-species alliances uh, with the productive and even force of zoo, although I'm not sure about how you really create cross-species alliances, but, you know, um, maybe that's... Uh, it's too hard for, but nonetheless. Uh, and uh, the uh, last thing I would uh, kind of uh, say here is, uh, uh, quote, experimenting with what contemporary biotechnological immediate bodies are capable of doing in the radical imminence of their respective locations. Now, this may sound enticing uh, to someone who is working in uh, performance art, for example, or bio art. And if you're into this field, you will know how much influence post-human feminism had on um, uh, in, the, in the art and how much it resonates with some uh, practices really. Uh, but there are obvious uh, problems here uh, with this uh, these kind of formulations of uh, politics. Um, and the one is uh, the inability, I think, for, of post-human feminism to conceive collective political agency. And this is really because it lacks any kind of uh, accent emphasize on reasoning cognitive abilities which enable 
uh, agents to cooperate to form complex aims and, and so and to work on a, a more kind of not exclusively local scale. The, the, the other thing is uh, that refusing to differentiate non-human agency and Rosebrell even calls, uh, says, uh, calls, uh, talks about accountability, but I don't know what kind of accountability that really is from specific human, that is to say rational agency and accountability. Uh, so the result is that post-human feminism effectively disperses responsibility among agents. So in, in contrast, actually, uh, to trying to highlight uh, uh, the, uh, the urgency uh, to act in, uh, in, response, uh, in response to uh, issues like climate change, this kind of uh, thinking really uh, can lead to, you know, kind of position, well, well you know, we are, we are all equally connected we, and th th therefore we are all equally uh, uh, responsible. Uh, so again, to highlight once more, the, the only difference between humans and non-humans, it seems, in post-human uh, feminism is uh, the difference uh, in embodiment and embeddedness, while at the same time, striking difference in cognitive capacities is systematically ignored. You know. And now I turn to politics of Zina feminism. Can you tell me just how much? You, you have, you have some 15 minutes. Left. Oh, okay. I have no, more, even more than enough. I was speeding. Okay, so... Um, you told it so well. Okay, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's... I, if I'm, I haven't made a human talk for quite a long time. Okay, uh, um, so... Um, uh, what I have to say at the beginning is that uh, sapiens is not only condition of uh, post-human political agency, but really, as I already tried to show, of condition for any political agency. Uh, and uh, here I quote Helen Hester that with, without sapiens, action is reduced to meaning just do something and collectivity understood as an alliance of agents with common aims and shared commitments cannot be formed. So uh, that is why uh, the uh, recogni recognizing our own embeddedness and assemblages of loose mutual reliance is simply insufficient for creating the conditions for collective responsibility and a fault. Uh, so in response to this uh, problem, to these problems that post-human feminism has in formulating uh, uh, politics, Helen Hester uh, uh, proposes her own uh, model of post-human agency, uh, which is really, uh, which is, uh, which, uh, uh, which is, which uh, is, or is formulated simply as sapiens plus care. Now, from traditional perspective, uh, which strongly separates cold rationality on the one hand and warm affectivity, on the other, these, these connection may seem um, uh, quite uh, problematic or unlikely. But in contrast to this, uh, although, you know, firstly, we have to say that again, from the uh, researches in uh, neuroscience, we know that, you know, rationality and affectivity cannot be that uh, simply, you know, separated as, that is, as, as it has been done traditionally in philosophy. So, um, uh, Helen Hester uh, talks about, uh, quote, uh, sapiens and care as fundamentally entangled from the get-go, insofar as, quote, the capacity to respond is also an ethical obligation to respond, end of quote. Uh, well, here here have uh, the problem because I don't actually see how rationality assumes or implies here care or how care logically follows from uh, from rationality or uh, from um, uh, the capacity to understand certain things uh, conceptually, right? So, in other words, what what I'm going to say is that you know uh, there is no reason why a rational agent uh, uh, wouldn't still uh, 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 per act perfectly only in its own self interest, you know. Uh, so. Uh, or the, the other uh, thing, even if you have, as, a, as an irrational agent, if you have, even if you have some duty or obligation to, towards other uh, who are equal to you, who, uh, uh, who uh, uh, 
participate in the same uh, discursive uh, 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 net or or uh, or what Brandon, for example, call uh, uh, space of reasons. You still kind of uh, is, you don't have this kind of uh, uh, reciprocal uh, uh, then kind of obligation towards uh, uh, those who who are, who aren't participating, obviously non-humans. So uh, what what I'm uh, actually uh, 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 kind of what, what I want to uh, emphasize is the uh, distinction between care on the one hand versus duty on the other hand. So uh, duty or uh, obligation implies the res uh, reciprocity, uh, exchanging not only of goods, but of reasons. And uh, while the care is unilateral. So it means that you, when you care for someone, you don't care really whether it can uh, somehow uh, reciprocate your, uh, to you or uh, somehow um, um, Give you something in return, really. It's a gift, as a, what their doubt might, might say. A anyway, uh, so uh, without without uh, kind of uh, willing to gender uh, this care, of, a paradigmatic example obviously is the care of mother for her uh, children. Now, um, uh, so uh, I, I try to show that equally post-human feminism and uh, and xenofeminism have uh, problems in uh, conceptualizing uh, uh, political agency. And uh, although uh, kind of I find myself uh, veering towards xenofeminism, uh, there are still obvious problems in here in really connecting this rationality of sapiens with uh, with care. And uh, from this. Uh, talk. Uh, what I really want you to uh, uh, take from this talk is are maybe two points, and that is that in order to create a political agency which will respond to contemporary issues such as climate change and the destruction of the uh, environment, it is not enough just to stress local entanglement and interdependence between humans and non-humans. In other words, it is not just in, it is not enough just to look at the things from this ontological or equally ecological perspective. However, you know, uh, uh, however correct uh, it, um, it may be. So uh, and the other point I want to stress is that despite its, I would say, somewhat undeservedly bad reputation, a reason remains indispensable condition for any kind of political agency, including post-human, and I think our most powerful tool for confronting the climate change. Thank you.